thanking the Ted Head Athens team for hosting this wonderful event and you all for your interest in my story today. When I was 13 years old, my father walked into my bedroom. His face was, was pale, as white as I'd ever seen it. He said that your cousin's been in an accident. My cousin was riding his bicycle, his mountain bicycle to work. He had just come back from lunch and he was riding his bicycle off a porch that was about a foot, foot and a half tall uh, in front of that store. This is something he'd done countless times before, only this time something went wrong. Instead of landing flat on his wheels, he was thrown from his bicycle, he landed on his head, he broke his neck, and he ended up paralyzed from the neck down. That instant changed his life forever. Many or most of you probably know somebody who suffers from a neurological or neurodegenerative disease condition. These include things like spinal cord injury, chronic pain, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, vision loss, um, deafness, etc. Together, these, these conditions affect about a billion people worldwide in varying degrees of specificity, varying degrees of, um, sorry, to varying degrees. And it turns out that uh, we are actually fairly bad at treating these diseases. So, if you engaged with, with your friend or loved one through this process, you probably came to the same question I did, which is, why can't we fix this? You know, we're, we're raised to believe in medical miracles. If you're sick, you break your arm, you go to the doctor, the doctor fixes your arm. You know, magic, two months later, it's back in business. You have a cough, you have something strange with your throat, purple pus, you know, they give you penicillin, and a week or two later, you're back, right? It's all gone, you're feeling better. Indeed, the pharmaceutical industry has delivered miracles such as, it uh, was mentioned earlier, the ability to stop the symptoms of HIV AIDS, a disease we didn't understand 30 years ago, the ability to regulate your blood cholesterol, diabetes, etc. Yet for this entire class of diseases, um, we can do nothing. Now, I'm an engineer, and engineers are problem solvers. Um, and this is a particularly, um, it, it doesn't sit right, right? We should be able to solve it. So um, I'd like to take you on the journey that I went through to try and understand some of these things. It turns out there are a couple reasons why we can't solve this problem. First, they're incredibly hard. Um, your brain is complex, these diseases are complex. Uh, to make matters worse, these diseases can occur over a long period of time. Sometimes a lifetime, uh, decades, etc. You can have subtle symptoms that take a long time to show. This is particularly challenging for developing uh, drugs through a, a trials process. Because in order to be able to treat something and get a drug approved, you need to be able to measure your endpoints, your outcomes, and show that you're having efficacy. Um, in neurodegenerative diseases, you can, it's the land of the $100, $200 million failed trial. Right? You spend a lot of money over a long period of time, only find out very late in the process it doesn't work. And the, latter, the, the, the last issue is that we may not, in fact, have the right tools to treat these diseases. So you can think of your brain, your nervous system, your peripheral nerves as one big computer. And the things that you feel, touch, taste, smell, allow you to move is the information flow on that computer through a series of different circuits. And these diseases, whether they're neurodegenerative in nature or due to acute accident, result in breaks in those circuits. So the information flow gets corrupted, and that corrupted information flow leads to the symptoms that, that we all associate with these diseases. Ideally, what we'd like to be able to do is just fix the broken circuit. Right? You know, put some magic glue in, make everything better, you're off to the races. Um, turns out we haven't figured out how to do that yet. The two tools that we, we have to work with today are drugs, you know, pharmaceuticals, which we've, we've mentioned a lot today, and electrical stimulation. So drugs are essentially chemicals that are ingested or injected into, uh, into your veins. They get distributed throughout your body, and they roughly try and encourage something good to happen, which gives you relief from symptoms of disease or stop something bad from happening, uh, potentially killing an invader. There are two problems with drugs to treat neurodegenerative diseases. The first one is um, how, how quickly they, they operate. So your nervous system, information flows through it in millisecond time scale. So super fast, all these impulses that, that send information all throughout. Um, a drug tends to work on the, the time scale of hours, you know, months, days, weeks, uh, so you can see that it's going to be hard pressed to fix the information flow problem with these. The second is one of specificity. So not only do these drugs get sent all throughout the body, but you know, as this scary slide shows, 
Um, they operate in complex networks of chemicals called pathways, and indeed there's an entire field dedicated to studying how these pathways work. It's called system biology. So you can put a drug in, and you think it does this perfect thing, and then five steps later, it does something entirely unpredicted, and uh, you know, either leads to side effects or problems with efficacy. So long story short, you know, the drug approach of the bath of chemicals has not been able to fix broken neural circuits and indeed impact these diseases as much as we'd like. Well, okay, it's a circuit, so what if we treat it like a circuit? You know, we know how to play with silicon and, um, you know, we, we're very adept at circuit design. So what happens if we put electrodes onto your nervous system and then control that way? Well, it turns out that actually works. Right? And this has been amazing. You know, we have things like um, cochlear implants that can restore the ability to hear to people who have lost it. Um, pacemakers work on a similar principle. Spinal cord stimulators to reduce pain. The problem with this one is you still have a specificity problem, but it's a problem of a different sort. So um, these devices work by sending an electric field into your neurons. Your neurons work, uh, they're an electrical system, and so Although you do trigger the neurons you want, there are also a lot of others that you don't want to trigger that you can. So for instance, if you have pain fibers next to muscle fibers, you have the potential to hit them both at once. Or in another case, um, you're trying to treat foot pain and you end up uh, helping the foot pain but causing a buzzing in your leg. So this is also really unsatisfying, right? You know, we have two good shots. We have drugs which we've been developing forever relatively newer treatments for electrical input, and it still doesn't, doesn't solve our problem. So what do we do? Well, first let's look at what our ideal solution is. Um, we'd like to be able to fix a broken circuit, so treat it like a circuit problem, um, like the electrical stimulation. But we'd also like to be able to be specific. So we'd like to be able to choose which part of that circuit we actuate and which ones we don't, so that we can respect the way the circuit is normally supposed to function and be able to re restore it back to normal. And then this goes back to the question of overall developing drugs and therapies. You want it to be really effective and quickly. Because if you can do that, then you have a chance of getting something through a clinical trial um, more cheaply and more quickly. Turns out, we actually have a solution to these problems in the near term. It's called optogenetics. It was invented by in 2004 by... Ed Boyd, who's one of the co-founders of my company, and a handful of other folks. The, the fundamental um, breakthroughs in optogenetics were to say, can we put a control system into your neural circuits that are not, that's not electrical? Right? Because when you send an electrical system, an electrical signal to an electrical system, it creates confusion. And so what they did is they switched the control signal to light. And then they also made it so that you can select which of these specific cells that you um, are turning on or off. Yep, that's amazing, right? So we can basically choose which piece of our brain or nervous system we want to interact and send information into that in real time. If you look, um, we're going to jump ahead. So if you look back at our um, circuit diagram before, rather than triggering the entire circuit um, like we did with the electrical stimulator, we can go in and respect the circuitry, and, and this is showing you know, two different colors of light where you can send different signals in. Uh, so how it works, you basically go into a set of neurons which, which are geographically next to each other but have uh, very different functions. And you genetically sensitize uh, one set of those to light. You do this using gene therapy techniques and you essentially put in a, a molecular light switch in that particular neuron. Then, when you introduce light into the circuit, only, even though like, all these neurons are close together, only that one type of neuron will be stimulated. So, this is, this is a big deal, because it, it gives us the potential to solve a bunch of the problems that we face in terms of um, treating some of the more, more difficult diseases and dealing with the complexity of the nervous system. Um, we thought it was such a big deal and so important, we started a company to try and bring these therapies out so that people, you know, like my cousin and your friends can benefit. Um, uh, joining us was also Alan Portsager, who's a, a vision scientist. So, what we did is we tried to find a system, you know, this is still a new technology, 
Um, there's still all the complexity that you have in terms of um, dealing with the brain and the spinal cord. So we tried to simplify this problem as much as possible. We tried to go into a circuit that a lot was known about and create the simplest intervention that we could think of that would have the, the biggest impact. You know, so proof of concept, help some people, and then let the technologies evolve and as they do, um, do bigger and better things. We start, decided to start with vision. Um, this is your eye. And then for, our, the, for the purpose of this conversation, the magic part is the retina, which is the yellow bit in the back of the eye. That's responsible for capturing light, um, doing some processing, and sending the signal back to your brain. If you look at a, a schematic, there are three types of cells that are most important here. One is the photoreceptors. These capture light, and they take that visual signal, they make it electric, and they send it to the bipolar cells, where things like edge detection and contrast are gone. It goes to the ganglion cells back to the brain. For an entire class of patients that, su that suffer from photoreceptor disease, these cells die. Um, examples retinitis pigmentosa, 100 to 200 different genetic mutations can cause this disease. Um, there are no good options in terms of pharmaceuticals to treat it to prevent disease. These patients you know, start out with it at birth. By the time they're, they're 40, 50 years old, um, often their visual field has collapsed from full vision like you and I have, slowly getting closer and closer to tunnel vision and then goes dark. Um, horrible disease that we'd like to be able to do something about. So what we did is we developed a therapy that would enable us to make the bipolar cells sensitive to light. And you use a, a gene therapy trick that enables you to have a specific protein just, just expressed on that cell. So you have the light switch just in your bipolar cells. And the ganglion cells are, are so the bipolar cells are now doing double duty. They're acting as photoreceptors and they're also doing some processing the ganglion cells are left to do their normal activity of bringing the signal back to the brain. And it turns out that it actually works. So um, a, lot of, a lot of this type of research is shown using animal models. You can see this is a relatively simple task. A mouse is trained to find a light to exit the maze. Um, it turns out that uh, mice hate light, but they hate being cold and wet more. <laughs> So you can, treat, you can teach them to find the exit. And you can see that healthy mice quickly dispatch the task. You know, within under five seconds, they're able to find their way through the maze and exit. This is uh, a diseased mouse. And you can see, you know, he tries really hard. He develops strategies to find his way through. Um, but he's using his whiskers. He's using his sense of feel. So this is like the 40-plus-year-old the patient with retinitis pigmentosa. You know, they still have ways to get on through life, but you much prefer to be the first, the first mouse. Um, and this is true of a number of different disease models, which, which these are. So, this last video shows the power of this class of therapies. These are the same mice, um, but now treated with, with an optogenetic therapy that goes after the bipolar cell. You can see this mouse couldn't see before, and now it's able to quickly orient and find its way out of the maze using the light. So, you know, this is amazing, and we need to be able to bring these kind of types of therapies to people, and that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so what's next? Um, you can see there are, there are a number of different genetic mutations. You're able to treat all of them because you're treating the fundamental problem, which is the ability of photoreceptors to capture light, not the under, necessarily the underlying disease. So it turns out, that over the, the last few years, um, there's been a tremendous growth in this research. There are north of a thousand labs um, working on this technology, doing everything from developing new uh, tools to enable you to better sensitize neurons, to mapping out connections to neurons, to figure out where we would put the next therapy, to developing new therapies for things like epilepsy and addiction, uh, pain, and many others. Um, and indeed, there are a handful of companies that are also have formed in the space that are trying to develop treatments of vision in other areas. And the pharmaceutical companies are, are starting to come in. So this is exciting and amazing. And I think that as we go forward, um, this will open up a, a brand new class of therapies and a way to treat some diseases that have um, bedeviled us for a long time and enable us to actually restore function to people, not just ask them to go. Um, this is... This is, uh, so that, that brings me to um, an ask or a request from all of you. Um, 
This is amazing, but it's also it's also early. And what we're trying to do is, you know, fundamentally bring a new way of treating these diseases. Um, when we first started the company, you know, the reaction we got when we talked to friends, or investors, and whatnot, we said, hey, you know, we're going to use this new technology, and we're going to enable blind things to see, and we're going to bring it to people. The first reaction was, that's impossible. Right? And then impossible moved to improbable, improbable moved to difficult, difficult moved to exciting. But we're not there yet. We still have, we still have a long road. Um, and so I would ask you know, that all of you provide your, your support, your enthusiasm, uh, your interest, and when things go wrong along the way, as they inevitably will, your patience as we all try and see this thing out to bringing these, these therapies into people. And if we do this, if we do this right, in the next, call it 10 years or so, um, we will see an entire new class of therapies where the next person that faces a, a crippling, life-changing diagnosis like my cousin will actually have an array of options to be able to restore their capabilities and not just cope with their disease.